Hey everybody, welcome back to the next lecture. We're going to get this one kicked off with some true or false questions. So as always with true false questions, I'm gonna stick here with you, give you a few seconds to think about each question and then we'll discuss the correct answer right away. So let's get started with our first true false question. So here you go, true or false, go. This is false. The erosions that are associated with acute gastritis are gonna be caused by one of three things, NSAID use, burns, or brain injuries. The brain injury, also known as the Cushing ulcer, this results in an increase in vagal stimulation that increases ACH, which increases hydrogen ion production. Burns, on the other hand, are known as curling ulcers, and these are the result of hypovolemia-induced mucosal ischemia. All right, let's move on to the next question. True or false, go. This is true. Remember, NSAIDs are one of those three causes of acute gastritis. Here's your next question. True or false? Go. This is true. Chronic gastritis, it results in mucosal inflammation that causes atrophy and intestinal metaplasia. That is going to increase the risk of developing gastric cancers. All right, next question. True or false? Go. This is false. Your most common cause of chronic gastritis is going to be H. pylori, and that also increases the risk of PUD and malt lymphomas. Now this is first going to affect the antrum, then it's going to make its way to the body of the stomach. All right, next question, true or false, go. This is false. So an autoimmune cause of chronic gastritis will increase the risk of pernicious anemia. Now the pathophysiology here is the presence of autoantibodies to the hydrogen potassium ATPase on the parietal cells and to intrinsic factor, intrinsic factor, which increases our risk of developing pernicious anemia. Now anatomically, whereas H. pylori first affects the antrum, this is going to affect the fundus in the body of the stomach. Now before we move on, since chronic gastritis can increase the risk of gastric cancer, let's cover some of the important details that we need to know about that. First, there's a condition known as Mediterranean disease, which itself is not a cancer, but it is a precancerous disease that's associated with gastric mucosal hyperplasia. And what they're gonna tell you is the gyri look so big that they look kind of like brain matter. And if you wanna see this, if you don't know what this looks like, Google it and you'll say, wow, that looks just like a brain. Now this condition results in excessive mucosa production and a loss of protein and atrophy of the parietal cells. This of course means that we are going to see a drop in our production of gastric acid. You can remember the main findings of this condition with the WAVE mnemonic. WAVE stands for weight loss, anorexia, vomiting, epigastric pain, and edema. Now remember that the way by which gastric cancer is going to present is with abdominal pain, early satiety, and weight loss. In addition to those very specific findings for the condition, don't forget, sometimes patients develop additional findings, one of which is acanthosis nigricans, and the other is the sign of lacer trela. The sign of lacer trela is simply the acute appearance of multiple seborrheic keratoses. Another important physical finding is that of Verkov's nod. Verkov, Verkow, however you want to present, uh, however you want to um, say it, is a hard nodule that's found behind or superior to the left clavicle, and this is indicative of metastasis that is moved from stomach cancer. Now, if the cancer is intestinal, it's associated with H. pylori and the intake of nitrosamines. Nitrosamines are created when we smoke foods, meaning smoking as in the cooking method. Okay? Other possible risk factors um, that are attributed are tobacco smoke, chronic gastritis, and achlorhydria. If you're asked about where this might show up, it's commonly found on the lesser curvature of the stomach, and it's going to look like ulcers that have raised margins. Now, diffuse cases are not associated with H. pylori, but are rather associated with a mutation of E. cadherin. And this is associated with those classic signet ring cells, which are those mucus-filled cells with the nuclei that are pushed off the periphery. Very, very typical, um, easy to identify. If you don't know what those look like, just take a look in your book or Google it if you wanna look at some additional images. Very easy to identify. You must be able to identify these. Now, stomach cancers are characterized by developing what's described as a thick 
leathery appearance. Think of sort of like an old football. It's got that sort of thick leathery type of appearance. Now, if you hear that description, you want to think specifically of Linitis plastica. Now, just a couple additional details that I want you to keep in mind. Um, if we see the presence of the Sister Mary Joseph nodule, this is a malignant metastatic umbilical nodule. And although it's quite rare, it's an indication that we're dealing with an advanced stage of malignancy. Now, bloomer shelf is a term that describes a palpable mass when we're doing the digital rectal exam. And if you see it, it typically suggests that metastasis has moved to the rectal uterine pouch. Now, over the years, I've seen this question on step one, step two, and step three questions. Um, so make sure you remember that. But they're going to describe the digital rectal exam finding. They're not just going to say bloomer shelf. So you have to kind of be aware of this one. Now, the last thing I want you to remember is uh, the Krukenberg tumor. Same thing as with bloomer shelf. Step one, step two, step three. This shows up all the time. The uh, Krukenberg tumor is bilateral metastasis to the ovaries. And this is characterized by the presence of a ton of mucin secreting signet ring cells. All right, let's move on. We're going to do a matching exercise next. I want you to match the type of ulcer gastric versus duodenal with its correct associated associations or findings. So go ahead and hit the pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. All right, so here are your correct answers. If you need to fix anything, please go ahead and hit the pause button and do so. Otherwise, let's take a look at what we need to know about PUD in order to correctly answer anything that's thrown our way on exam day. Now, first, remember that we're going to get either a gastric or a duodenal ulcer in this condition. And one of the easiest ways to figure out which one we're dealing with is going to be its association with respect to mealtime. What do I mean by this? It's simple. If the pain someone experiences gets worse while they are eating, consider the likely cause a gastric ulcer. Now, this often results in uh, weight loss. Why? It hurts too much to eat, so they just stop eating. They minimize their food intake so that they can minimize their pain. Now, if on the other hand, when they eat a meal, the pain goes away or it diminishes, it's likely duodenal. Why does this happen? Because when you're eating, nothing escapes the stomach, not even acids. So the duodenum gets a chance to rest. Very typical, make sure you know those associations. Now, H. pylori, is it associated with one or the other? What do you think? It's strongly linked to both, but if you had to pick what it was more so associated with, that would be the duodenal ulcer. Now, the mechanism for how these occur is similar, but there's an exception. So in both of these, there's a decrease in the mucosal protection against gastric acid. But in a duodenal ulcer, on top of this, we also see an increase in gastric acid secretion. That just gives the disease sort of a two-pronged effect, which can worsen the problem. Now, NSAIDs are, of course, associated with the gastric type, while Zollinger-Ellison syndrome is associated with the duodenal ulcer. And in fact, one of the most common ways by which they're going to get you to consider Zollinger-Ellison syndrome is by outlining that unrelenting duodenal ulcer that is not improving, even though we're implementing aggressive treatments. Keep that one in mind. Now, do you know, of these two, which one is more likely to lead to cancer? That would be the gastric ulcer. Some of the most common complications associated with ulcers, of course, include bleeding, obstruction, and perforation. And that brings us to an important um, bridge between anatomy and path. So bleeding, of course, in this instance, will be one of our most common complications. And it's really important that we recognize a couple of important vessels because if ulcerations eat away at either one of these, we have to deal with it. And we need to know where the vessels are so that we know where the problem is so we can go in and fix it. So remember, if we have an ulcer on the posterior aspect of the duodenal wall, the bleed is most likely coming from the which artery? The gastroduodenal artery. If on the other hand, it's coming from the lesser curvature of the stomach, the bleeding is coming from which artery? The left gastric artery. Now don't forget that someone who presents with an acute upper GI bleed is more likely to be caused by peptic ulcers versus if they have a lower GI bleed. And don't forget that the anatomic marker that separates the upper versus the lower GI bleed is the ligament of treats. Anything proximal to this, this ligament will be considered to be an upper GI bleed 
anything distal is considered a lower GI bleed. Okay? Now, when it comes to obstruction as a complication, the two likely places you'll see this is, the, uh, is in the duodenum and at the pyloric channel. Now, perforation, that's our final complication, and this is more likely to be seen in the anterior aspect of the duodenum. And this will result in pneumoperitoneum into the anterior abdominal cavity. And one of the imaging findings that they love to throw at you on exam day is the presence of air under the diaphragm. They may tell you that the patient has referred pain to the shoulder. Um, if either of those is seen, you need to be thinking about um, a perforation as a possibility. Now, if you do get referred pain to the right shoulder as a result of air under the diaphragm, that is caused, or that's referred pain, and that is caused by irritation to the phrenic nerve. All right, let's move on to the next question. We have a multiple choice, so go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. All right, the correct answer here is B. So what we have to talk about now are our malabsorption syndromes. You want to consider things like celiac disease, lactose intolerance, pancreatic insufficiency, tropical sprue, and Whipple disease anytime you see a vignette and it sounds like malabsorption. So let's dive in and go over the important details we need to know about these conditions. Now first, remember that no matter what we're dealing with, if we see malabsorption, patients typically develop diarrhea, steatorrhea, weight loss, weakness, and of course, if it's long-term, they may develop um, deficiencies to fat-soluble vitamins and even minerals, okay? So important to keep those in mind. Let's start with the lactose intolerance first here. This is, of course, caused by a deficiency of the lactase enzyme. Now, typically, as someone ages, they don't create as much lactase, okay? So this is something that you typically see normally as people age. There are those certain viral illnesses that can cause villus injury, causing the same problem. So, you know, that's probably less likely what they're gonna ask you, but something to keep in mind either way. Now, patients who have a lactase deficiency develop an osmotic diarrhea with a decreased stool pH. And that's something they're definitely going to tell you about if they want you to make a diagnosis. Now, another test we can do, or a test we can do, is the lactose hydrogen breath test. And that would be done and positive for lactose malabsorption if the post-lactose breath hydrogen gets above 20 parts per million as compared to a baseline value. Now, if you have a patient presenting with this and they say, what do you do? Uh, I mean, there's two options here. We can give them lactase supplements or we can just have them avoid lactose. Either way, uh, typically deals with the problem. Pancreatic insufficiency is next. This is the result of conditions of the pancreas like chronic pancreatitis or even cystic fibrosis, whereby you're going to see um, predominantly malabsorption of fat-soluble vitamins and vitamin B12. Now, two important findings that are going to tip you off to this are decreases in duodenal bicarb and fetal elastase. Okay. Tropical sprue is next, and this is going to affect the small bowel, and we see this typically in people who live in the tropics or who have visited or are visiting, and this typically results in a decreased mucosal absorption in the duodenum and jejunum, but it can make its way to the ileum, which means at that point, patients will experience a deficiency of both vitamins B9 and B12. That's where they're absorbed. Uh, Whipple disease is next. This is, of course, caused by trophorima Whipple infections, and this is characterized by cardiac, neuro, and MSK symptoms, mainly in the form of arthralgias. Now, you want to look for the mention of past positive foamy macrophages in the intestinal lamina propria. That's often a clue given to you in a vignette that is screaming Whipple disease. Last but not least, we have celiac disease. This is an autoimmune-mediated intolerance of gliadin. Gliadin is a protein found in wheat, and this results in malabsorption and steatorrhea. Now, it's important that you remember that this is associated with certain haplotypes, specifically HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8, and is often also associated with dermatitis herpetiformis. And that's something I've seen on questions consistently for the last 15 years, that association with dermatitis herpetiformis and um, celiac disease. Now, there are a few antibodies that you also want to remember associated with celiac disease. We have the anti-endomysial, the anti-deaminated glidin peptide, and IgA anti-tissue transglutaminase antibody. Now, patients typically will demonstrate um, atrophy of the villi, hyperplasia of the crypts, and intraepithelial lymphocytosis. 
Now, don't forget, this is most likely to affect the distal duodenum and the proximal jejunum. The d xylose test is used to help us confirm our diagnosis. All right, let's take a break there. I will see you guys on the next lecture. Thank you.